Thank you very much for joining us. I hope that you and yours are well. I'm Justin Vogt, Managing Editor of Foreign Affairs, and I'll be moderating today's event, which is brought to you by the Atlanta Council and specifically the Council's Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. This event is on the record. We're going to be discussing a fascinating and important topic, the intersection of climate change and pandemics. Can becoming more resilient to the effects of climate change also help us cope with pandemics? What about the other way around? Does the fight against COVID-19 offer any lessons for how to adapt to climate change? We're lucky to have three experts on this topic here today to share their insights into those questions and others. Francis Suarez is the mayor of the city of Miami. He also serves as a commissioner on the Global Commission on Adaptation. Dr. Aaron Bernstein is the interim director of the Center for Climate, Health, and the Global Environment at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also a pediatric hospitalist at Boston Children's Hospital. And Kathy Boffman McLeod is a senior vice president at the Atlantic Council and the director of the Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center at the Council. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so by the time the pandemic arrived in full force here in New York City, where I am, uh, it was mid-March, uh, we at Foreign Affairs, the magazine, were finishing up our May-June issue, which featured a special package of articles on climate change. And we were a little bit worried that the issue would seem out of date by the time it came out. Uh, you know, after all, how many life-threatening, world-threatening calamities can you expect your readers to pay attention to it at one time? Um, but instead of ripping up the issue and trying to rush something on the pandemic, something else occurred to us, and that was that the two problems actually share a lot in common. They're both driven by massive technological, economic, and, and social changes that have been brought on by globalization. They both involve governments and international organizations struggling and generally failing to cooperate. Uh, they both demonstrate the importance of expertise and science in public policy. And they both require the kind of rational, far-sighted, national political leadership uh, that's lacking in much of the world today. They also highlight the difference between mitigating a problem and adapting to its effects, which is part of what we'll be talking about today. Now, the world has basically failed to mitigate climate change. We haven't reduced carbon emissions that lead to global warming and destructive weather and rising seas. And that's why communities, often at the local level, and with very little input from national governments uh, have had to get really smart about how to adapt to these new conditions. So pandemics have a similar dynamic, right? Ideally, we would prevent outbreaks or at least quickly contain them, uh, but doing so requires international cooperation, trust in institutions and science, far-sighted national political leadership, all of those are in short supply. So it's communities and citizens who have wound up having to figure out how to become resilient. And just as it's unlikely that we'll see a lot of progress on climate change at that international level anytime soon, I don't think it's a safe bet that we'll see a whole lot of improvement at the international level when it comes to preventing or containing outbreaks. So just as communities have had to become resilient in the face of climate change, they will also have to become more resilient in the face of pandemics, this one and future ones. So the question is, can adapting to the effects of climate change help us build resilience to pandemics? Better yet, are there things that we can do that will help us become more resilient to both threats? And finally, um, because I think it's always important to consider trade-offs, uh, are there any ways in which these two efforts might be in conflict, right? Is it possible that adapting to climate change might actually make it harder to cope with pandemics uh, or vice versa? So that's sort of how I see our discussion today. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk to our expert guests. Uh, I've got some questions for them and uh, I hope that everyone participating at home uh, does too and you'll be able to submit those and, and we'll take questions uh, from you as well later on in the program. Um, I wanna start with you, Mayor Suarez. Um, Miami is ground zero for a lot of these things that, that we're talking about. Um, climate uh, effects uh, and the pandemic. You've had uh, you know, health impacts there, economic impacts like everywhere. 
Um, but also Miami is, you know, experiencing sea level rise. Obviously, hurricane uh, uh, season is, is, is near. Um, so you have this special perspective. And I'm wondering, how has your city's experience of, of climate change shaped your response to COVID-19? And how has your experience of COVID-19 shaped how you're thinking about future efforts to adapt? As you said, uh, they are interrelated, and there are uh, scenarios under which uh, there can be a conflict. I think the conflicts are, are, are easy to, to identify. The conflicts are bandwidth conflicts. I think for us, you know, we're an organization that uh, is good at dealing with uh, emergencies. Uh, we've been, we have a track record of dealing with hurricanes that stems back decades. We, uh, I always like to say that we're the, you know, we went from being the most wind resilient city on the planet post Hurricane Andrew to, to attempting to now be the most water resilient um, you know, city on the planet. And there are certain many water resilient cities that we want to uh, emulate for, or, um, you know, be just better at, at managing our water issues uh, post Hurricane Irma. Uh, but, but we do have bandwidth capacities. I mean, there, there is only so much that we can do. And given the fact that, uh, you know, this pandemic has sort of overwhelmed the system, if you will, and caught many, many cities flat footed, um, you know, I think it, 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 takes up so much of our bandwidth, so much of our attention that it does uh, in some ways hurt our ability to, to program out uh, the kind of uh, adaptive uh, sea level rise uh, programs that we are in the process of, 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 of doing right now, executing on. The good news is that uh, there are some um, shock absorbers, if you will, where you know a lot of the funding that we would normally have for sea level rise and for resiliency is protected uh, by the fact that it was bonded out. So it was, it was money that we borrowed uh, against the revenue stream, and that insulates it from this kind of financial situation. I think where we have concerns is to what extent, and you sort of alluded to this in your introduction, to what extent are other governments that would provide or other organizations that would provide matching funds going to be able to meaningfully match the kind of contribution that we've already uh, established uh, but I do think, you know, in terms of the fact that both of them are, are you know, are, are essentially uh, acts of nature, force majeure uh, incidents, and based on the fact that uh, cities like ours have to be willing to operate on an emergency basis, um, I think that there are a lot of similarities. The, the, the main difference, I think, is, is, is the fact that, you know, this pandemic has been very acute. We're dealing with it day in and day out, getting reports two times a day and making decisions on opening, on closing uh, sort of rapidly. Whereas sea level rise is, is, is a phenomenon that we're adapting to and trying to mitigate in sort of a more long-term way. And uh, I think that there's going to be a tremendous amount of lessons once we're able to um, hopefully uh, put the COVID-19 pandemic in our rearview mirror. Uh, we're, we are going to understand very quickly that we're living in a new world. Uh, and that world uh, is going to require us to to make changes. And I know that we call that sort of the new normal, and it's kind of a cliche already, uh, and it's been maybe overused. But the truth of the matter is there are uh, some aspects to our new world, uh, to our post-COVID-19 world, which I, I would call it um, a world with pandemics, and where, where this is probably the first in a series of pandemics that we're going to see, not just uh, COVID-19. And, and we as a society have to be, uh, prepare for it. And that's what being resilient is about. Can I ask you just to follow up on this, this question of bandwidth? Um, are you, do you, have you noticed as you've, in the past two months, as you talk to people about this, citizens and, and, and other leaders in Miami, um, do you get the sense that are people kind of like, oh, climate, I don't want to hear about that right now. We, we have some, the serious thing to deal with right in front of us. Or, or do people in your experience just anecdotally seem to see the two issues as linked? I think it's just, a, it's just, when I say a bandwidth issue, I'll give you an example. I, I, I spoke this morning uh, to a good friend of mine, Mayor Eric Garcetti from Los Angeles. And, you know, he's an energetic, articulate mayor. And he just basically told me, I'm tired. <laughs> I mean, I, he's like, I'm tired. And I, I honestly didn't expect to hear that from him because he's a, the kind of guy that doesn't seem like he could ever get tired. He seems like someone who has boundless amounts of energy. And right. you just said, I'm tired. And, 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 you know, when you look at an organization, it has limitations. You know, even our organization, we're a billion dollar uh, company. 
with 4,500 employees, four labor unions, um, and all the international problems that we have to deal with as well as the city. And, and Adrian knows a lot about uh, the international involvement that our city um, is, you know, the things that we're involved in. So, uh, you know, it's just a capacity issue. It's, it's, it's a simple, you know, we're, we're dealing with an acute crisis. It's a, it's a sick patient and we, we need to get it healthy as quickly as we can. And it's very hard to do that with all the resources that we're dedicating and then deal with other major issues, whether they be sea level rise, whatever they, whatever they may be. There are so many of them. Let me, you mentioned, you mentioned a sick patient. Let me bring in uh, the doctor on our panel, uh, Dr. Bernstein, Ari. Uh, you're a pediatrician. You lead a center at, at Harvard, focused on climate and, and human health and the environment. Um, what can you tell us about this relationship between climate risk, what we talk about when we talk about climate risk and contagion risk? What's the most important sort of link or the best way to understand the way that these two things are linked if you zoom out a little bit? Yeah. Thanks, Zach question, Justin. Uh, you know, I think it's as simple as that they share the same causes, and that means they share the same solutions. And, you know, Mayor Suarez, I think, hit the nail on the head where he talked about how cities around the country, around the world right now, are just their bandwidth is, is enormously difficult. Certainly true in the hospital I work in, uh, everyone is flat out. And, and so you now realize we have an infectious pandemic, which is straining everybody including the most energetic among us. <laughs> and now, you know, hopefully we will get this in the rearview mirror and we're still going to be dealing with climate change, which turns out to be another, you know, substantive challenge. But the good news is that if we do things that address climate change, we're going to do stuff that makes us more resilient. And so in this period where everyone's struggling for bandwidth, my mind is on where we can get the most value for our dollar. So, you know, consider things, and, and you raised this question earlier, Justin, around resilience. Are there things that we can do that build resilience to climate change, can in fact mitigate climate change and buffer pandemic risk? And the answer is absolutely. And we need to be doing those things to the extent we can. And a good example of that is actually what um, uh, you know, folks at the Resilience Center have been working on. Uh, it turns out that planting trees, as silly as that sounds, does those things. And, and, and importantly, and I think it's actually undervalued, we know that trees sequester carbon, we know they buffer air pollution, which is a big problem for this disease, not just for dying from it, but for getting it. Uh, trees cool down cities. Uh, we know that, you know, and there's an equity piece to all this, the pollution, the heat, and, and, the, and the heat in a place like Miami or the, you know, <laughs> in a place like Boston, where there's even less air conditioning, uh, you know, we turn on the AC, that costs money, and that money is a greater share of the household income to the poorest families who tend to be in the neighborhoods with the least amount of green space. So we need to really take this moment to say, if we've got limited resources and limited bandwidth, where can we get the most wins for the least cost? Now, there are other things that, you know, get beyond the purview of an individual city. But, you know, I look at things like air pollution. So air pollution for most people in cities is from burning gas. Uh, uh, we know that, you know, uh, burning gas is a lion's share and growing share of the nation's and the world's uh, carbon emissions. And so you stop doing that, you not only prevent a huge share of global carbon emissions and local carbon emissions, but you make it less likely that people get sick with COVID. You make it less likely that they die from COVID. And of course, all of the pre-existing conditions that we know <laughs> make COVID more dangerous are caused by air pollution. Mm -hmm. So it's a pandemic resilience thing. Uh, it's a health uh, equity issue. It's a carbon issue. And, and, you know, we talk about building resilience. We often think about buildings, which are critically important, our civic infrastructure. But the health of people is the biggest factor in our resilience to stressors, whether that's climate change or COVID. And so I think there are real reasons to take pandemic solutions as climate solutions and to think as best we can as to the shared value there. Kathy, you, you wrote this article for the issue of foreign affairs that I was talking about earlier um, uh, about all the things that, that people and communities often on a very local level can do. And the thing that struck me when you were describing your argument to me was, was how, you know, uh, Ari talked about something silly like planting trees was, was just how um, small bore some of these things are, but they have a huge effect. Like 
painting roads a color other than black, right, to reduce heat, or planting rooftop gardens, uh, stuff that just, you know, when we think about these huge international problems often aren't the first things that come to mind when we think about international accords and treaties and major legislative packages and stuff that, that, that when, we, when we talk about a resilience and adaptation, we're often talking about a much smaller scale. What I'm curious to hear about is having written this piece and, and, and thought a lot about this in the climate uh, context, what are some examples um, of the, the kinds of, those kinds of ideas um, that might actually sort of fortify us in this, what is probably gonna be this age of pandemics, um, you know, as the mayor said, more than one and not just COVID-19. What are some of those things that we ought to be thinking about? So I'll start by talking about the, um, the formula for risk and risk is the flip side of resilience. And so when you think about risk, risk is the, um, the exposure to a certain threat times the vulnerability times the hazard. And so we focus at the Resilience Center and uh, for those who don't know at the Adrian R. Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, we have set a goal of reaching 1 billion people with resilient solutions by 2030 to the challenges of climate change, migration, and human security, which we would define as public health, pandemics, food and water security, et cetera. And so when you think about that, uh, that formula, we believe our best ability to make people more resilient is in that vulnerability piece. And Ari talked about the underlying vulnerabilities of people being healthy or people being not healthy and more susceptible to things. And so many of the climate adaptation interventions that we uh, work with, and I'll go back to your, you referenced a couple of them, uh, urban horticulture or um, rooftop gardens. There's a expansive urban horticulture program in Quito, Ecuador, that has 12,000 uh, gardeners that have put kids through school and changed the fates and futures of uh, mostly women-owned uh, gardens and their market specifically for them. Uh, that gives everybody better access to food. That allows the aquifer to recharge with a uh, permeable surface. It cools areas. It cools the city. It cools your building. Those are multi-benefit uh, interventions. And so our continued um, work, of course, based in evidence and science, will be how to maximize and prioritize public health and uh, contagion risk reduction in these often highly achievable localized interventions, of course, at scale, because we're in a hurry to get to a billion people. I guess one question that that sort of pops to mind for me, and I, I think you know you you alluded to it, uh, Mayor Suarez, and I'd, I'd like to hear your take and the, and the others as well um, on this. Is uh, in addition to bandwidth, there's a there's a uh, a fiscal or financial sort of element to all this. We are we're in the middle of a what's going to be a massive recession, uh, maybe something even closer to a depression. We don't really know yet. Um, and and a couple of you have you've all alluded. Uh, in, in different ways to kind of efficiency and, and most bang for the buck as Ari, as you put it. I'm, I'm wondering from, from your uh, uh, perspective, uh, Mayor Suarez, you know, are you, how concerned are you that for some of the things that you feel you're going to need to do or that you're going to want to do on, on, in this area, um, are, are you worried about how the economic fallout uh, of the pandemic is going to affect your ability to do that? And if so, what's the, what do you do? I mean, what, what, what is a mayor to do? I think the biggest issue that we have, we're lucky in some sense, and I sort of alluded to this in, in my introductory comments, because a, a significant part of our funding is based on a, a, a tax that we, that's sort of a dedicated funding source that we bonded out against or that we're going to bond out against. So that, that is, is probably going to be stable. Uh, what we were expecting and hoping for, of course, is matching funds from other governments, from the state and from, uh, from, from the federal government, from the state. We, uh, we felt that there were some opportunities based on some unspent uh, a, a, you know, prior hurricane of, of funds that were in, you know, we're in some conversations with, uh, we were in some conversations with the governor and, and we were given the impression that we may have a pot that we can pull from. But certainly in terms of our own general fund and our own fiscal picture, it's, it's not pretty, you know what I mean, for this year. Um, and that's only after you know, having a couple of months to analyze uh, what it is uh, that we're in. Uh, we don't know, of course, 
uh, how much longer we're going to be uh, uh, dealing with the, 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 the lingering imp economic impacts of, of this virus. I mean, is this going to last another two months? Is this going to last another six months? I mean, is this going to last another year? Um, and so, you know, when that happens, uh, uh, you know, things get somewhat budgetarily apocalyptic for us. And we have to, you know, we have to figure out ways to just maintain uh, our front, you know, you know, frontline responders uh, who are the ones that really are the first line of defense and have been putting themselves at risk in this uh, COVID-19 battle. You know, police officers, firefighters, paramedics, of course, uh, you know, even our sanitation workers uh, who have to, um, you know, confront uh, a variety of risk uh, on the medical side in terms of the, the materials that they're handling. So, um, you know, I, I think that's going to put pressure on our government and it's going to put pressure on other governments. And I'm sure there's a lot of pressure in the philanthropic community as well. So, I, you know, without a doubt, this economic uh, impact is going to have some measure of, of impact. Again, for us, the good news is we have sort of a dedicated funding source that's significant. And I think we can uh, advance the ball quite a bit with that funding source in terms of, you know, the projects that the specific projects that we're working on. Uh, to, to make us more water resilient over the next five to 10 years. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that we can um, be very efficient in the use of those funds. Ari, I wanted to, to sort of uh, push back, not quite push back, but push a little bit on, on something that, that you, you had said and, and sort of get a little more um, uh, detail from me about it. You know, you had said sort of that, that, um, that climate uh, solutions can be pandemic solutions. And one thing that I know that's, that has been happening in, uh, you know, all over the world and that I, I think has had a major public health element has been urbanization. Um, and it's also had a major climate element, right? And it's basically been a good thing from a climate point of view, right? Density um, can create efficiencies and create scale. And, and um, I wonder if that's one area though, where how do you, how are you thinking about that going forward? Because I, 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 my impulse as a person who lives in a big city, it's very dense has been to see that density as, a, as something of a vulnerability in this, in, in this moment. And I wonder about that tension and how, how should we think about that? Yeah, no, thanks for raising that. It's a, it's a tension that's been raised in many corners. You know, is this a call to depopulate cities? Should we bail on public transportation? Uh, various things that people have been saying are more sustainable and better for health are now being called into question. And I, I think this comes down to, you know, what's the cost of doing that to other goals that we have, like promoting health, uh, economic opportunity. And I think it's pretty clear on balance just at first pass that that's really going in the wrong direction. But, but I think, Justin, your question gets to another and, and arguably um, uh, more powerful point, which is that when it comes to things like climate change or pandemic risk, once we're at a position where we're you know, dealing with a crisis budget or you know, a crisis situation, a hospital, when we're having, you know, as we talk about in the hospital, patient coding, there's no great alternatives. There's not like you have a great spot over here and a terrible spot over here. You're, you're doing damage control. Right. And so it really forces the question, what do we need to do to not force people into these places? And, can, and the reality is, as Dr. Swar uh, as Mayor Suarez said, you just got a promotion, Mayor. Congratulations. <laughs> at, least in my, at least in my book. <laughs> I'm a jurist doctor. <laughs> Excellent. There you go. Uh, you know, we, we know that pandemics are, uh, the risk of pandemics is growing, and we know why. We know that the emerging infections are coming from wildlife into people, and we know that we are changing how we engage with wildlife through the wildlife trade. The United States is the largest consumer of wildlife from around the world. Uh, through deforestation, uh, we know that deforestation, major cause of climate change, major course. And so we have to realize that sure, we can throw whatever it is now, trillions of dollars at a problem after the fact, but can one imagine a situation where a pandemic like this, you know, we could have a pandemic flu next year. And, and so we need to deal with the problems we know how to prevent now. <laughs> we need to do that because the alternative is not moving to the hills, because that's not going to help anybody. We need to take the cost effective measures that really prevent these things so that, you know, I can do my job, the mayor can do his job, <laughs> that we all can do our jobs and not be caught you know, dizzied in, in, a, in, a, in essentially an irretrievable mess. 
and trying to pick up the pieces. I, I think that's a really important lesson. And, and another thing that's come to mind with this question is, mm -hmm. you know, it turns out that these kind of problems, we really do need to work together, right? We, we are only going to, you know, I look at what goes on in the hospital. This is, an, you know, the, what, you know, I have seen a comparatively small amount of risk. You know, I think, you know, to people who are, you know, taking away my garbage and the people who are making sure that the power's on and the risks that they're doing their jobs right now compared to baseline are probably seeing more risk than I am. But the way people have banded together in this moment of crisis is extraordinary and shows us what we can do when we have the resources we need, a common purpose, and, and can see that, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, which I'm hoping with this either through a vaccine or, or, or really good um, measures to keep this at bay, we're increasingly seeing. Kathy, one of the uh, one of the issues that we talk about when we talk about climate change, and that has, has really been part of the pandemic as well, is the uh, the unequal distribution of burden or cost or pain um, amongst you know. And we've uh, in climate change, we talk about how in the United States, people of color, the poor, uh, the marginalized, sort of tend to bear the the brunt of of uh, climate impacts, um, and that's been just inarguably the case with the pandemic as well. And I guess it, when I look at this, sometimes it's just, I, it's a little depressing because it's like, well, it's almost predictable. I mean, it, it's, it's like, you know, I suppose, of course, of course, that's the case. That's the way our society sort of seems to work. That's the way the outcomes seem to happen again and again. Um, is there, is there a reason to be hopeful that this experience with the pandemic might might change that at least vis-a-vis -vis this kind of problem or climate change when you look at that and, and you read about that and you see those figures what what comes into your mind uh, for, you know sitting where you sit well in uh, it's clear what you said is absolutely true that you can do a, a easy correlation between uh, people that exist at the lower rungs of the economic ladder and uh, the more deaths by air pollution happen in neighborhoods that uh, don't have tree cover. Um, and you, yes, absolutely yes. I think the answer to your question about is there hope, is there an opportunity? The answer to that is also yes. It has uh, been revealed to us. It's, it's as if the, the pandemic has been the um, super equalizer and it has everybody, it's impacted everybody. Now it's of course not the same, but it's shown us the people that we rely on the most who are in the positions that Ari mentioned. Um, we, they make society run, that they are an essential, essential huge part of our economy. And we have been under investing. I mean, that's an epic understatement for uh, hundreds of years. And this is an opportunity for us to invest in, um, in the equity, equitable investments in health, in green space and conservation, in climate adaptation measures, in all manner of economic development and economic growth initiatives that um, raise the standard of living, raise people out of poverty. And I think we can um, see big changes in outcomes. And so those maps that we, we've been seeing every day, the New York Times putting out those maps, showing that inequity, it's right, uh, right there, we can change that. And while we're all down on our knees trying to figure out how we come out of this, this is the opportunity to figure it out. What that gets at is the, is really a political question, though, and I want to kind of turn that to to our elected official here, right? You, you know, um, when I hear you say that, part of my mind thinks, well, yeah, that would be true if that's how politically it were playing out. Um, and sometimes I, my read of it is that instead of getting having a unifying effect some of what the pandemic has done has has been to shine a very harsh light on the divisions that already exist I, you know mayor you're 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 better equipped to to talk about this than anyone else i mean how have you seen this event as being um unifying when it comes to the big the big picture stuff like climate change pandemic prep, you know preparedness uh, do you do you am i wrong am i am i seeing a kind of false narrative uh, in, in seeing all a kind of divisive uh, quality to the, the political and social response to this. What do you see from where you sit? What I see is uh, whenever there's a sort of a, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a hurricane, any sort of natural disaster, there's uh, first uh, a coalescing. I think people do coalesce and, and, and at, to some level a band together. And there is uh, typically some sort of a positive impact in terms of 
of you know the compassion that you see, but you also see those stark divisions. And I and I can tell you what we see them in the city. Uh, I do probably somewhere between three and five feedings, uh, you know, where we're distributing food. Uh, and and so for some, this uh, pandemic has gotten to the point where we literally lack the ability to have food. And I think some people. Just like uh, during a hurricane, when there's no electricity, we take for granted. You know, those who have generators, uh, home generators, they live, you know, much more luxuriously than those that don't. And so there is uh, definitely a, a a divide. And I think part of our, um, you know, I think where 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 the pandemic is similar uh, to uh, climate change is that it forces us to look at these things again, and it forces us. Uh, you know, the, the term resiliency is about uh, dealing with shocks to our system. And those shocks can come from a variety of different uh, places. I think uh, in the climate conversation, oftentimes uh, resiliency takes up, it seems to take up the whole space of that climate conversation. But the reality is that resiliency is much, much bigger than that. And this pandemic has, has given us another uh, aspect of, of what it takes to be resilient. It means being innovative. It means, uh, you know, trying to be as adaptable as you can, as you can be uh, in terms of a, as, as a city and as an economy. And just look at, I know restaurants that have been in business, small businesses that have been in business for 50 years who are struggling to survive uh, because, you know, a very small percentage of their, of their um, distribution is takeout or delivery. And, and so one of the things that I tell them is, look, you know, as you come out of this pandemic, you're going to have to look at your business models again. Um, you know, there are some positive things in terms of the ubiquity of, of, of the ability to communicate. How difficult would it have been for us to do this very forum that we're doing right now without uh, the magic of Zoom? You know, pre-COVID, there was maybe 10% of the people knew what Zoom was, or maybe it was used by 5 10% of the population. Now 90% of people are using Zoom. This is like my seventh or eighth Zoom chat of the day, and I still have like three more to go. So, you know... It creates a very powerful tool for us uh, to democratize information and 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 to democratize. Uh, but then it then it presents some other inequities, right? Which is how many people have bandwidth? Right. How many people have computers? Like literal uh, bandwidth. <laughs> literal bandwidth. No, and I mean right. I don't mean yeah. right. Exactly. Like a right. literal bandwidth. I, I, not as a right. you know how many people have computers? How many people have the technological tools to be able to like I I, I bandwidth is now something that's coveted, right? Because you want to be able to have Netflix going, you know, you're on a Zoom chat, your kids are on their virtual school and, you know, and how many kids, how many kids in the inner city uh, can do something like that? Uh, so it, it does highlight uh, stark uh, inequities that we as a city have to confront and, and have to be honest about and have to find ways, uh, you know, to, to, to help in, in our city. And I'll just finish by saying in our city, um, uh, one of the big issues is, is income inequality in terms of um, housing costs. And when, and when Kathy talks about, you know, the, the change in the way we look at um, our frontline essential workers, right? There's sort of a definitional change. And the question becomes, how are we as a government going to react to that? And, and are we going to compensate them for the risk that they're taking that maybe before we were undervalued? And I think that's something that needs to come into the conversation in terms of our union negotiations, living wage, uh, type things and, and making sure that people uh, have enough money to, to 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 thrive in this economy. Let me ask you one quick follow up to that. I, I'm you know we're we're all all of us citizens are going to be looking to political leadership in the months and years ahead to to work across the aisle to overcome sort of partisan divides, ideological divides. On the national level, I'm I'm afraid that does not seem to be happening at all. Sure. On the, on the level of city politics where you are, are you finding that your usual political opponents or adversaries are more open to talking to you to, to get stuff done? Has this had any kind of effect putting aside society at, at large, but just amongst the kind of political class in, in Miami? Has there been an effect that's noticeable? So I'll say two things. One is in the I'm not sure that there's a solution to the two party system. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know that that's ever going to get solved. Uh, you did see some collaboration on the first stimulus, um, which seemed sort of uh, pretty obvious and easy. Um, and But since then, there's been pr pretty much a breakdown of collaboration and going back to the usual silos and then understanding that there's a presidential election, which makes things even worse, you know, in the midst of all that. 
Uh, locally, I can tell you, um, you know, at, at a very local level, our commission has come together. We had some personality issues and we sort of banded together, which is incredibly, incredibly helpful during this kind of an emergency. Um, we have seen some personality issues between governments. Uh, the cities have kind of banded together. The county has been uh, not as responsive and not as responsive to the city. So a lot of it is personality driven, but some of it is ego driven. And some of it is, you know, other people that have other political ambitions. Like I don't have an election this year, so I, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm just trying to do a good job, you know. And, and my philosophy on getting reelected, which I have one reelection next year, was if I do a good job, it will take care of itself. Um, and I think, uh, you know, fortunately, not everybody feels that way. And, and and my office is nonpartisan, so so I have the benefit. I mean, I was elected by 86 percent. I mean, you can't get elected by that percentage unless you get people from every single party uh, and and no parties. So um, I think that's, uh, that's just a different way of doing business. So it's more personality driven. And thankfully, this, this has definitely coalesced the personalities and sort of taken away some of the ego. Thanks for that answer. That's interesting. Um, I'm going to, we, we, we do have a couple of questions rolling in from our participants. And I, I, I thought now might be a time to, to start taking some of those. Um, there's one in particular for, uh, for you, Ari, that I, that I thought, thought was a good one. And I, I want to share this with you. Um, the question is this, in a time uh, when the current presidential administration is, or current administration, excuse me, is rolling back EPA regulations, and Harvard has put out a study connected hi connecting higher COVID-19 deaths with air pollution, why don't we have the medical community up in arms denouncing these environmental and public health protection deregulations and rollbacks that the EPA is, uh, the EPA is in the midst of? Do you have a, a reply to that or a response to that? Well, I, I'm not sure that we... <laughs> Perhaps we're not as visible as we need to be, but certainly I've heard plenty of people speaking from a position of science, talking about what's known about how these changes to regulations are, are, are not necessarily the wisest move at any time, let alone in a pandemic that is clearly sensitive to air pollution. But, but to the person who asked the question, um, I, I would say that you know we can do more and we need to do more. I, I think people like me who, um, you know, one of the things that's come out of this pandemic is people look to science more than ever and people are increasingly looking to the people they know in their communities more than ever. So people turn to their local officials, their local public health officers, their primary care provider to help guide them with knowledge. And so we do need to do more because it's still, we still in this conversation uh, that we're having right now, when I talk about, you know, climate solutions and pandemic solutions and resiliency in the same breath, people often get upset that how could I be talking about, you know, these two things in the same breath when we're dealing with this crisis. And, you know, the first time I saw a child who likely had COVID and I went into the room and I dressed up in my alien suit, and I'm trying to befriend this girl who's like six years old whom I've never met before. It's hard enough when you're not in an alien suit. And somehow he managed to talk and I touched this girl's hand, I realized that I'm essentially potentially connecting myself around the world because the virus potentially in her body is the same virus that started somewhere halfway around the world. And, and that connection immediately made clear to me that we have to realize that these things are entwined. <laughs> and, and so we need to communicate that better. We need to be much more articulate and much more personal. And I think if we do that, then we're going to see better progress at what I was talking about before, which is doing the stuff we know we can do to prevent these things from happening. <laughs> that includes pandemics and climate change, because everyone will understand that where they live in the communities they live, these actions are going to benefit them right now. This is not a hundred year proposition. It's not a 20 year proposition. It's a now proposition. And it's particularly important, as we've all talked about, for those people who are most vulnerable. Uh, which it turns out, as COVID has made so clear, we are only as healthy as the most vulnerable people in the communities in which we live. And if we want to, and you know, there's an altruistic reason to protect them, but frankly, there's a selfish one too. That's very well put. I, I, I think that's a good way to frame that message. Um, I have, there are two questions that I want to direct both to you, Kathy. They're, they're related, and I think, you're, I think you'll, you'll have a good uh, grasp on these immediately. Um, they're both audience questions. Um, the first one is, 
uh, do you think that the ongoing anthropocentric degradation of wild ecosystems, especially the rainforest with its variety of animal species and their pathogens, increases pandemic risk in the future? And in consequence, if so, should we focus on broadening the area of nature reserves on a global scale? The second question, which is related is, how realistic is it is the idea of planting trees as a solution to climate change? And if it, it is a real solution, are there organizations that are working on that nationally and worldwide? And which ones are they? So the answer to the first one is really easy. Yes, yes. Uh, the linkages are clear and uh, Dr. Bernstein could lay them out in great detail. Uh, but the the deforestation pushed bats out of their habitat in West Africa, pushing them closer to human beings. Thus, um, you know, a pandemic is born um, in that way. That's just one of the ways. But the the multi benefit of nature based solutions, and there's something somewhat funny about the fact that it becomes, you know, we have a um, a term of art called nature based solutions when it is the most fundamental thing that we should do and know and be as uh, a species on the planet that are the air we breathe and the water we drink. But they're um, the ecosystem service, as it's called, that they provide to us, let's just take the trees for a minute, um, are cooling cities that are rising in temperature. Um, even with painting roofs white, the trees can lower temperatures something like nine degrees, which is just remarkable. And in some places, even like 14 or 15 degrees. And they um, absorb stormwater and runoff that can bring waterborne disease and illness they um, absorb and store carbon, they uh, lower utility bills, they absorb pollution and reduce vulnerability for people having asthma that would then make you more vulnerable to having um, uh, respiratory illness. And so um, there are many great organizations that are working on forests and expanding forests for all of these reasons. And some come at it from a climate perspective and some come at it from you know, the American forest uh, comes at it from a tree equity perspective, the World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, um, WRI, I mean, an immense amount of organizations. But one of the things that we've come to understand in terms of the, the forests um, and financing, and I just want to make a point about the linkages to being able to pay for these um, interventions. And some do have cash flows associated with them, and they can be um, could be innovative with mechanisms. And this is um, in a field called conservation finance, which lots of folks are familiar with, but the mayor mentioned how the treasuries are going to be depleted, immensely depleted. And I think we all understand why and how that's gonna happen. But one of the biggest issues is the operations and maintenance. How do you finance trees and expanding forests and do so not just to plant them, but you need to know which species and where and how much it costs to maintain them. And we want to make sure they're in the right places, particularly meaning um, in places that are underserved so that you get that maximum benefit. And so uh, they, I believe that the nature-based solutions, nature is our superhero and we need to um, invest heavily, heavily. And just for putting some numbers on it, um, Credit Suisse, the World Wildlife Fund, and um, McKinsey did a, um, a study in 2012. So given this is eight years ago, but they said we could sustain the earth's biodiversity appropriately if we invested 300 to $400 billion every year. And so we didn't do that. There's a gap of $250 billion uh, between if you take what um, governments around the world are so, and, and uh, philanthropy, there's still that huge gap and that's still an eight year old number. The point being, think what we've spent, think what we've lost, think of the lives and livelihoods and the economic loss of development gains um, because we haven't done it. And so we've seen some great cost benefit analyses going around around COVID and um, Rod Shaw, the president of Rockefeller Foundation talks about the $400 billion we're losing in economic activity each month we stay home in the US versus the cost of a testing scheme that would be something like, um, I think the cost was a hundred, a hundred billion. Um, we're just, what we're doing just doesn't make sense. And so I think one of the key things we need to do for health, for pandemic risk reduction, for climate adaptation and for sustaining ourselves is to invest in nature. 
here's a question, uh, uh, Mayor Suarez, for you. This is actually really interesting. Two people have asked this, and it's something that was on my mind as well. It's kind of a practical question um, that, that gets at another connection between climate change and the pandemic. How do you manage emergency planning in places like Miami or even in Michigan, as we're seeing with these floods, where you have these dual threats of natural disaster and pandemic? For example, how do you plan for evacuations but have safe social distancing and, and shelters? How do you how do you do that? Are you you must be gaming this out as we speak? To, you know, fill us in. We're gaming it out as we speak um, <laughs> because uh, you know last, when we had Irma in 2017. We had the most massive evacuation order in the history of Dade County. We got the dirty side of the storm, and so we got a tremendous amount of flooding. It wasn't a, an intense storm in terms of wind speed. I think it was a Category One at most when it came through. At least when it came through Miami, it, I think it got stronger uh, as it as it continued. But uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're, we 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 sheltered tens of thousands of people during Irma, Ten, and I and I visited many of those shelters and. I can tell you that uh, social distancing and, and, and hygiene is going to be an issue. Um, it, it is an issue that we're going to have to start preparing for. And so it, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming to think of, of what, what it would take for us to be able to successfully um, house the same number of people that we had uh, during Irma. Um, and I think we're just going to have to work together uh, to find creative ways and, and probably open many more facilities than we opened during Irma. That's probably going to end up being the key. We're going to have to, you know, we let the county do a lot of that. We're going to have to get more involved as a city. Uh, and, and by the way, just one thing uh, on what Kathy and, and Dr. Bernstein said about trees in particular, uh, we, we require um, many developments to, to uh, basically pay into what they, we call a tree trust fund and uh, in the city. And, and, and I'm, I completely concur with everything that Kathy said uh, about you know, the, the benefits of having a, a greater canopy. Um, we're you know, focusing on having, uh, expanding the percentage of, of our urban spaces that, are, you know, that have trees. One of the big uh, obstacles, frankly, is, is the energy grid uh, because much of it is elevated and above ground and actually interferes with our ability to plant trees or you have these poor, I feel so bad for them, these trees where they, you know, where they cut through the middle of them because you have power lines running through them. So, you know, we, um, that's, that's, that's a concern and we're going to have to work with the power companies to try to make, uh, to have a more resilient energy infrastructure while at the same time, um, you know, being able to continue to plant trees. And I'm, I'm very big into solar and I'm a big believer in solar. And I think that solar is going to be, um, sort of the wave of the future, certainly for Miami, for a place like Miami, that's very sunny. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the, the distribution of power interacts with the fact that we can harness power very inexpensively or pretty much inexpensively. Um, and it's going to continue to get less expensive over time with economies of scale. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to see how that allows us to increase the canopy, uh, which obviously would have some impacts also on solar because you have to uh, grow the trees in a way that it doesn't block the sun from from getting to the panel. So that that's uh, everything has its its pluses and its minuses. Right, uh, Ari, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to this audience question as our OK Boomer question, um, and I'm I'm putting it to you because I think you you'd be in a good position to answer this one. It's interesting. The question is, or the the audience member says, it's ironic that the pandemic is mainly affecting older people in a lethal way while climate change will hugely impact today's youngest. Do you see the pandemic as possibly resulting in better intergenerational cooperation? Boy, that's a really rough bargain to get to intergenerational cooperation. Look, I mean, it, takes, it takes a lot. <laughs> so, so just to be clear, climate change is a huge risk to older people. And I'm particularly thinking about this summer 2019 was the hottest summer on record. 2020 is shaping up to be the hottest year on record. April is the hottest, dead heat for the hottest April. And, you know, in Miami is concerned about hurricanes. I'm worried about the first heat wave in Boston. If we have a second wave of COVID with a heat wave, it's the same challenges. How do we get people to cooling centers? Is that going to be safe? Are people going to want to go? It's the same. But, you know, we know that people who are older die in heat waves. <laughs> That's who's at risk. Um, I mean, it's not that children are. But I, you know, the question hits on a really important point, which is what we face 
and building resilience to these challenges is solutions to pandemics and climate. We know these things. The challenge we face is the common understanding and the common purpose to do what's necessary. The economics, by the way, are also not the challenge. The cost effectiveness is abundantly clear, whether that's the Clean Air Act and reducing air pollution and its dividends, deforestation. We now have greater evidence about this question was raised. Investments in conservation, protecting forest payback, hugely and are remarkably inexpensive. What we need to do is find the reasons that people are going to go and vote and are going to be activated to take these things into consideration in the public sphere. One of them is health. When we make clear that these actions are going to make people healthier today, that their uncle is not going to have a heart attack, that their child is going to have to go to the hospital struggling to breathe, that their uh, spouse who's pregnant won't have a baby born too early and suffer a lifetime disability when we do these things that reduce air pollution. People are going to be very much motivated to say, I don't want air pollution. But the other argument that also in the United States is transformative to taking issues that can be immensely political and making them actionable and personable is the issue of intergenerational equity. That people who are of a generation of my parents and grandparents would never live and die comfortably knowing that they had taken actions that jeopardized the welfare of their children and grandchildren. And that is a moral purpose that pretty much everyone understands. And we can do stuff that doesn't just protect that piece of equity and what is the concern of so many people and put it into action. But of course, it protects both sets of people, the very young and the very old. That's well put. Um, Kathy, the, the, uh, uh, one of the other questions we've had here, and this relates to what Ari was talking about, and I, I'm interested in your point of view on it because you, you have a background both in the private sector and in public policy. The question is that, you know, we had a, a crisis in 2008, a financial crisis, and that raised some hopes for an environmental reset, um, but that didn't really come to pass. And the question is, what could we do differently post COVID-19 to have a successful reset, right? And this gets at some of the things we're talking about. How do you convert a crisis like this, um, you know, from a public policy point of view, political point of view, just a sociological point of view, what do you what do you need to do to avoid what's happened with prior crises where that sort of progress that we might have hoped for didn't really materialize? Well, I'll stick to the, uh, to at least to start in the civic engagement and the, the ballot box and who's making decisions and um, look at the number of women that have been elected to office um, and the number of women and people of color more so than ever. And it's not enough, but it does change the way public decisions get made and the way votes are cast. And so when uh, the leadership of the country, of a city, uh, reflects the community, better decisions get made. We met that, we have science to back that up. And so I think that's one notable thing that's different from 2008. The other is um, we are just getting hammered by uh, storms that have been exacerbated by, uh, well, not just storms, floods, fires, droughts. Uh, the hurricane season started early this year. Fire season doesn't have a season anymore because California is just having season, you know, it's a 365 day season. Um, the, the impact to India while they're having COVID-19 um, numbers increasing. I mean, these are things that we can't ignore. And so uh, while we have um, a more representative uh, leadership and not enough, but, but better than in 2008, um, we have a different distribution of the um, geographies of the pain of COVID-19's economic outfall. And we have a better understanding of what to do. We have a lot of experience and we, we know what to do. We have the evidence, we have the policy examples, we have the cost benefit analyses. Um, we have to all um, hold feet to the fire and get it done. And so I, I think we're in a better position to do that now than we were. I mean, I, there are some things that counterbalance what I said and the tendency toward um, turning inward nationally and seeing more um, um, governments of um, less democratic taking shape and COVID-19 
can fuel some of that, but we have to hang on to work with our allies and our shared interests and um, use science and what we know and invest in the right ways. And we're in a better spot to do that, I think, than we were in 2008. I want to, before I turn it back to you, Kathy, for some concluding remarks, I wanted to just ask all three of you a kind of rapid fire end of session uh, thing. What's the what's the one thing if you had to if if we had to if our audience members had to leave this Zoom call with with one thing that you were thinking of with the next major challenge that we're going to face just with the the pandemic and what they can do to to you know help in their own community or help nationally or help internationally if they're going to close down their computer and go back to their lives what's the one thing you want them to have in their minds. Um, you know, going forward in the, in the weeks to come quickly, just like a 20 second, even one word thing. What is it, Mayor Suarez? For me, it's discipline. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's uh, exercising discipline, listening to your local leaders and to the doctors and the medical experts who are telling us or giving us a path forward. Uh, if we follow that path, we have a very good chance of diminishing the virus to a point where we can continue uh, to open up the economy. If we don't, um, we could have to reverse it or see a second wave. And I think so for me, the word is discipline uh, and following through on, on the advice that we've been given. That's a good answer. Dr. Bernstein? Well, the mayor beat me to the punch, but the word that came to my mind was, was patience. You know, I, I think that everybody wants to get life back to normal or as close to whatever that is as quickly as possible. And, and you know, the challenge is that this virus doesn't care about what we want. And so we just have to keep our eyes on the ball and be mindful that what, what constitutes progress, what constitutes what we all want, which is getting our lives, you know, someone asked me what I wanted for Father's Day. I said, I wanted to take my boys to our local playground. Yeah. You know, that my path to doing that isn't a straight line right now. And, and to get there, we have to be, as the mayor said, disciplined. We have to recognize that we have science that can help us understand what the right steps are. If we push too fast, we're going to make that path, you know, more crooked and slower. If we push too slow, we're going to make that path slower. Science ain't perfect, folks. It's not that it's going to give us a surefire and people are going to have misestimations. But I can tell you, because I get to work with these folks day in and day out, these people who are helping us figure our path using science are enormously dedicated. They spent decades of their life working on this stuff. Their existence, frankly, has been created by U.S. taxpayers. I mean, these people are funded by the federal government's NIH, and we are reaping the benefit of our investment in health in this process, as painful and awful as it is. And the good news in my mind is that because we invest that way and we have the ability to do what we have to do, we could do some things better, but you know, a lot of things are doing well, is that we're gonna see our path forward. And what my sincere hope is, is that when we get on this path, we're gonna realize where we can get the most value because we've stripped things down, you know, as the mayor started with, you know, we're now looking at the core of what matters. And so when you grow from that kernel, you can really emphasize what's important to people. My hope is we can, as I alluded to, bring the value of health, which is critical for resilience. It's critical for addressing climate. It's critical for preventing pandemics into the decisions that we move forward as we find, at least in my ideal world for Father's Day, the path from here to the playground. So Kathy, discipline, patience, what's your, what's your key word? And then can you leave us with any concluding thoughts? Yes, thank you. Uh, my uh, two words are band together, know your neighbor. The science around social cohesion is crystal clear. We survive better through all sorts of shocks and stresses when we know our neighbors and we support our neighbors. And so um, build that community and lean on it and support others. And we've seen that through uh, all sorts of inspiring stories uh, that are people helping people through this. And this is a long haul, we're gonna need it. So band together would be mine. And um, I'll say at this point, I think it's time for us to, to close and I'll say thank you so much, J Justin, for uh, facilitating and leading this conversation. And thank you to Foreign Affairs for not pulling back on that issue and dedicating it to climate change. You did the right thing. <laughs> and I think this conversation, I hope, has been validating uh, to Mayor Suarez for all you're doing locally, globally, um, and 
uh, to Resilient 305, which has been a testament to your community's resilience in every way from every threat and every stress. It's really impressive how you have ban uh, uh, banded together yourselves in your community. And uh, Dr. Bernstein Ari, um, for the clear articulation of what um, a vision of health can be and the convergence of these issues, which um, we we need to not just keep talking about them, but finding those um, and and performing those interventions that prioritize public health and put health back into the value chain, uh, which we we will do. And I think we know one thing: we're not going back. There's only one way, and that's forward. And that means doing things differently. And there's something better on the other side of this. And uh, we all have, I think, what we need to find it: the the passion and the expertise and um, the social capital and the science. And so um, I thank Adrian Arsh, who has joined us today, our, our founder and the inspiration for our center and to the Rockefeller Foundation for their support of our work. And I thank all of you for joining us today. And on behalf of the Atlantic Council and the Adrian Arsh Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center, we hope to see you again at another conversation. This will be recorded. And I hope that lucky number of you that came in early, um, you'll be receiving a copy of this uh, special climate issue of foreign affairs for the May, June issue, we'll be sending it to you. So thanks for tuning in and we look forward to our next conversation with you. Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.